Alrighty, folks. So, finally, uh, we are here. And where here is, is actually talking about an entire chapter. Well, one chapter out of your book at a time. Um, up until now, some of you book readers may have been a little frustrated that um, you couldn't just sit down and read a chapter for what we've been talking about. It was a little bit from here, maybe, or a little bit from there. And that's why God made indexes, thank goodness. We can go to the back and see, you know, where this vocabulary word is talked about and whatnot. But, um, but there is an honest-to-goodness mineral chapter in your book. I want to say it's two or three. Um, but that's why there's table of contents, because every so often they do shuffle the chapters, and then your teacher tells you the wrong chapter number, and, 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 and so I just... I know this is a chapter. But. That being said, all right, um, you guys are kind of used to, hopefully at this point, my PowerPoints, all right, and we just uh, finished up a test, so you know that, uh, hey, that test looks an awful lot like your PowerPoints. You're right. So, my point being is that when you're reading the chapter, and I do encourage you to do that, if you see something that we didn't talk about in lecture, I'm not going to test you on it, okay? But I've gone through there, cherry pick some stuff out, what to talk about, what not to talk about. Similarly, and I don't think that applies to this chapter, but if it did, um, if there was something in lecture that I talk about that did not, for whatever reason, show up in that chapter, it is quite possibly on the test, all right? because we talked about it in class. And this is what I meant on the first day when I said I, te I test based on my lecture. All right. You do have the, the chapter for support, for backup. Okay. And as I said, we want you to read that. But um, when you see a whole lot about, oh gosh, I can't think of something right off the top of my head, but um, aluminosilicates, let me just make something up. Uh, that's a real thing, I didn't make it up. But, um, see a whole page and a half about aluminosilicates. You're like, man, I don't remember him talking about aluminosilicates at all. Don't worry about it. Feel free to read it, enlighten yourself, etc. But don't stress test-wise. All right. Sabish, understand? We good? Good. You guys ever look at sand? I mean, like, really look at sand? And it's neat stuff, and it is all different. All different. I once heard that sand is a bunch of fish poop. Uh, there is probably quite certainly fish poop in sand. Um, sand varies from whether or not you're at the coast to whether or not you're in a desert to uh, whether or not you're up in um, Rome, New York or Albany, New York, where believe it or not we do have some sand plain-ish dune kind of things. Um, the glaciers drop from here. Okay. Uh, sand is all different, and one of these days, if I'm ever lucky enough to retire and have some time, um, I always wanted to make a coffee table book of uh, really zoomed in pictures of sand. It would look like stained glass windows. Uh, if they still have coffee table books by then, maybe it'll be screensavers for televisions, who knows. But um, always something I want to do because sand is so amazing. And I've got uh, samples of it from wherever where I've been that has sand. And then uh, when some folks have gone to various places, they've brought me back sand. And uh, I've always appreciated that. As long as I know where it comes from, I could use it in this eventual book, or I could catalog it in this sandbank I've been forming. Yeah, that was a joke. Sandbank. Uh, um, good. Thank you. Um, not all jokes are funny. So, w what's in sand is anything from fish poop, as he said, uh, to twigs and seaweed and, and whatnot if you're near the shore, but broken down bits and pieces of rocks and minerals, okay? And um, like I said, all kinds of, you, you know, you guys have been looking at minerals in lab now, so, uh, and if you haven't, I'm recording this for a couple different classes here. If you guys haven't looked at minerals yet, you, you will be looking at minerals yet soon. Um, you know, they comes in all shapes, colors, so on and so forth. 
and all of that broken down by weathering and erosion over time. Sand's, sand's amazing stuff. So this uh, sand picture here, I thought it was a great background for those little teeny tiny bits and pieces that were once giant rocks, etc. So what's the difference between uh, sand and gravel? Size. Just the size? And sand is only made from basically oil? Mm -hmm. We, uh, it, is, it is so not this chapter, but um, you guys are going to, when we get the weathering and erosion, you're going to learn boulder, cobble, pebble, sand, silt, clay. Okay. And you guys know those all as nouns right now. You use boulder, you use a picture of cobble, hopefully, of gravel. We don't use the word gravel, um, but uh, some folks do. Um, that comes in, gravel comes in right around pebble and small cobble. Anyhow, you guys know those things all as nouns. Sand is a noun. Uh, but in here, we're going to teach you that they are uh, sizes of, of fragments. Sand is anything from 2 millimeters in diameter to a 16th of a millimeter in diameter. So whether or not it's a hunk of um, granite or chipmunk and cedar tree, uh, it is sand-sized grain. So. All right, anywho, minerals is the topic of the day. This is not a definition of minerals. I am going to ask you on this test coming up what the definition of mineral is, and many, many folks write right here. Even though I have a slide that says the definition of a mineral on it, you guys always write this. Um, please don't write this. I'll have to mark it wrong, but I'm asking you not to write this for the definition of a mineral. This is like saying meatloaf is composed of meat. It's not really a definition. It doesn't help you too much, right? So, minerals are composed of one or more elements. It's important, first of all, it establishes two things. That minerals can be compounds, right? And also, uh, it establishes that some minerals are only really big hunks of an element. We don't get the question too often, like uh, when you guys have sulfur, okay, um, what's the difference between this and the element sulfur? I never get asked that question. But I get asked a lot with our halite, and then when sedimentary rocks, we get the rock salt. They're like, what's the difference between rock salt and halite? How big it is, uh, really, or how pretty it is. Halite ideally has that nice cleavage you can see. Um, and usually, you know, if you're looking at a smaller size specimen, and then rock salt is this sort of Marlboro man of, of the, the mineral world out there all beat up and worn and still tastes like salt if you lick it, but it sure, you know, doesn't look much like it. So we've got the elementals and we've got the compounds. You guys been working on memorizing that periodic table? We slowly but surely started introducing you to it. Now, luckily for you guys, there's only a handful of elements that we see over and over and over again uh, when we talk about minerals. All right. In fact, um, there's really like a top eight that somebody made a list of one day. And out of those eight, the top two make up three quarters of the composition. So we're going to focus, as, as you can imagine, we're going to focus on those top two, uh, oxygen and silicon. Now, it didn't work out this semester, fall of 23, that you guys have the atmosphere questions and the mineral questions on the same test because... It always gets confused, and some of you may have tripped up on the last question. You know, what was the primary ingredient in the oxygen, or in the oxygen, in the atmosphere? And you're all hung up on thinking air, oxygen all the time, because oxygen is so important to us. But oxygen is actually number what in the atmosphere? Two, right. Well, finally, and this never makes sense, oxygen's number one in the earth. So in the solid rock, you got more oxygen than you got in the, the atmosphere, but is kind of weird percentage wise 
I, I don't think anybody's ever counted the molecules, but. So that always mixes you guys up. So it'll be separate this time. And you'll be able to remember that oxygen is the primary. All right. You guys love numbers and abbreviations, right? Here we go. It's geology. We love to round. You've been learning that. So we're going to say 47% and 28%. And 8% and 5% and I guess we'll round 3.6 up to 4 and 3% and 2.6 will round up and 2%. You, you end up over 100. All right. Um, if you didn't round, I'm not even still sure where that ends up at. But uh, it leaves you about 1.5%, just trust us on this one, of almost everything else that's in that periodic table. Not everything. There's some stuff that only exists in a vacuum on Thursdays and so on and so forth. But but most of that stuff in there. And if you think about some of the things you already know, uh, think about precious metals and gems and, and whatnot. Um, and some of those are elementals, gold, silver, platinum, to name a few. The fact that they consist of less than one part of one and a half percent of everything that's in the crust there. Well, that kind of puts it in perspective. Now, I do not expect you to remember this list, but as I said, it is very important to talk to, and which is the higher of the two. Also quite important. But when you get to the point where you're looking at those formulas, you're going to see iron over and over again, aluminum over and over again. I mentioned the word aluminosilicate the other day. That's very, very popular. Okay. Uh, calcium, sodium. You see a whole lot of potassium, but potassium's in one of the main ones. But it's not like it's in a gajillion different things. But magnesium, again, you don't bump into that so much in 101 class at any rate. But boy, those top half dozen really do. So oxygen and silicon. You're going to hear until you are sick of it, and that's exactly my point, because you won't forget it then, about oxygen and silicon and the group that they make, the silicates. Okay, again, this semester we've already kind of started putting, except yesterday we didn't have class, started putting mineral groups on um, the specimens you've been looking at. Monday could tell us, though. See a lot of silicates in that list? Yeah, it was like 1 through 12 at least. And, and then some. Silicates are everywhere. Okay, absolutely everywhere. And again, if you think back half a step, it makes sense if the two most common ingredients are silicon and oxygen, and when silicon and oxygen get together, they make silica, then um, that silicates, the mineral group made up of silica, plus a couple things, would be the most common group, right? So there's, there's these handful of test questions, but they're all related. And if you just remember that one simple fact, that the top two ingredients are oxygen and silicon, just answer <laughs> silicates every time, right? Almost. We also say that's a fairly decent cheat on the rock test. All right, if you don't know what the hell the mineral group is, good chance it'll be a silicate. Now, don't, I don't want to see silicate silicates all, all the way down every blank, okay? But there's a good chance. Roughly half of the 31 that we see, maybe slightly more than half, are, are silicates. So... Okay, so I, this is just narrative. Don't write this down. Um, this is basically how I open. A mineral is. Okay, here it is. A mineral is. Four things. A mineral is naturally occurring. A mineral is inorganic. A mineral is crystalline. Crystalline. And a mineral is composed of a fixed set of chemical and physical properties. 
we're going to go over each of these with its own slide. So if you don't get all of one of these words when I change it here at the end of this sentence, don't worry, you will see them again. Naturally occurring, inorganic, crystalline, fixed set of chemical and physical properties. So what does that mean? Oh, I don't care how you memorize this. You, if you do bullet lists, do bullet lists. If you do a sentence, I think this one makes a very nice sentence. Definition of a rock, a little clumsier. I just need to see those, well, it's more than four words, but I need to see those four components, okay? And you could even throw in a mineral that's composed of one or more elements. I won't take away points for that. But I got to see crystalline, naturally occurring, inorganic. All right, so let's talk about this. Naturally occurring. It's hard to define this without being redundant. It occurs naturally in nature. It's not man-made, woman-made, squirrel-made. It just is. Um, yeah. So, I get asked every so often, lab-grade diamonds, sapphires. We're making really good copies these days. And I don't even mean like back when I was growing up, there was uh, CZ cubic zirconia. I'm still around, I'm sure. But um, that was a fake diamond. Well, now they have real fake diamonds. Not, um, not contradictory, are those minerals? Well, you could argue um, we're getting to the point where we're going to be growing uh, organisms in labs soon enough, if we're not already. Are they organisms? You know, that, that's more for your philosophy class than, than anything else. But the idea is, is that these things just naturally uh, form, grow, exist. Uh, on the earth. So the only difference between uh, that don't ask me. Go ahead. To, so if we were able to like perfectly at some point in history like recreate like a diamond where you couldn't tell the difference between it and an actual mm -hmm. occurring one, uh, would that mean that the only difference between the two is just where it was found? Kind of, yeah. We actually can, can do that now. Um, what I'm hearing is that they're they're better than nature makes. They're more perfect. I wouldn't say better. They're more perfect than what nature makes. Less imperfections. Um, but then you know, does that? It depends what you value. You know. So, um, like I said, it's a huge debate out there in the realm that cares about such things. But uh, but when we talk about stuff in here, I'm referring, of course, to things that you could dig out of the earth. But yeah, technology's catching up. Inorganic. All right, remember the prefix in means not. Okay, so not organic, which means is we kind of just, you know, went this road, but it is slightly different. Um, it is not a byproduct of life because there are organic things that are naturally occurring. The grass out there, etc. Okay. So, um, and, and one could argue life um, in general. But uh, so this was not alive, never alive, never will be alive. Now, for those of you coming from environmental science um, who are aware of uh, much bigger cycles and systems out there, yeah, I'm sort of glossing over that, okay? Um, the fact that the nutrients, when we, you know, you hear about um, you need your vitamin, Oh God, let's look at vitamin D as an example here. Uh, you need potassium, let's just say, okay. Um, where did the potassium comes from? Bananas, right? Where did the bananas get the potassium that they're gonna provide you with? Or, you know, where did they enhance the potassium? Well, it came out of the soil. It came out of the, the plant food. Okay, well, where did that come from? Yeah, that came from rocks and minerals. But, again, it's a much bigger picture, much bigger cycle. This is a 101 class, that's a 202 question kind of thing. So, inorganic, it's not alive, never was alive, and like I said, the never will be. It could certainly become part of something eventually, sure. We're a closed system, okay, the Earth. So, 
everything needs to recycle. Crystalline. That's much easier to picture. Um, pretty much you all can think of uh, a crystal, and quartz crystals tend to what comes to mind for people. Some people picture a favorite ring or something like that. that that's totally fine. When I talk about crystals, I usually talk about Legos, because um, again, everyone can picture Legos. And we want to build with crystals, and what do you build with? You build with, with Legos. So you'll hear me use Lego talk a lot. Um, all solids are crystalline, okay? And um, when you talk about things like metal and, and whatnot, it gets a little confusing, but deep down they say, all solids are crystal. I always wondered about wood myself. Wood doesn't seem very crystalline, but this is what they tell us. I'm not a mineralogist. Fixed is a word that catches on a lot of people's tongues. We mean fixed as in unchanging. Okay? Unchanging. Um, you guys have been trying, hopefully with some success, to recognize minerals in the laboratory based on a handful of properties that we tell you. Color is this, hardness is that, luster is the other thing, so on and so forth. You would not be able to do that if they changed every damn time the thing grew. We wouldn't have been able to make those tables 200 years ago, whenever they did it. There would not be a science to it at all. All this is saying is that that is true. Now, I used to say it didn't matter which one you said first in the definition. And I, I don't mark it wrong if you put physical in front of chemical. But over the years, I have definitely gained an appreciation for chemistry. I, I, I to be honest, I was not a fan as a student. I was the math. I thought chemistry was cool, but oh, I hated the math. Um... But over the years, I, I've come to realize that it is the chemical that makes the physical. You are what you are because of your chemistry. The tree is the tree, the squirrel in the tree is the squirrel, all because of different chemistries. The chemical makes the physical. Weird. I had uh, my game last night had a squirrel in it. We were talking about squirrels now. Yeah, I talk about squirrels a lot, actually. You'll find that as we go through the semester. Could it be a religion? Might have been premonition. I don't know. Could have just been that squirrels are awesome fodder for dreams. I mean, I used to have a deja vu one with everybody for weeks. Yeah. That's just confusion, probably. But you never know. So, sodium chloride is a great example, okay? Um, whether you go to the scariest, cheapest grocery store on the planet you could find, to McDonald's, to... I don't know, $1,000 a pound organic pink Himalayan evaporated sea salt. It's all going to have, except the pink part, it's all going to have the same properties. It's going to have the same hardness, the same luster. It should all be cubic. I've argued this again with myself when I buy the evaporated Himalayan pink sea salt, that in those giant grinders, there aren't perfect little cubes in there. But if you go to McDonald's or Wendy's or Burger King or anywhere else, and or you open a jar of Morton salt or generic, and you open that up, every single one of those little salt grains is a perfect little cube. That's the point. Okay? And every single one of those tastes exactly the same and has the same hardness. And so that's what we mean. Okay? And again, the chemical makes the physical. Those colors. And you're going to see that a lot of because we, we see fluorite, right? And fluorite comes in so gosh darn many colors. Um, those are teeny tiny fractions of, of imperfections, um, variations in the mix. You accidentally drop a little cinnamon in your chocolate chip cookies and they're like a whole new thing. You're like, oh my gosh, I got to make them like this every time now. Would someone recognize it as a chocolate chip cookie even though there's cinnamon in it? Yeah. All right, still a chocolate chip cookie. It's just a little different. So it's still recognizable. All right. Naturally occurring, inorganic, crystalline, unchanging properties. Learn it, live it, love it. Okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Moving on to classification. And again, this semester you've had the 
opportunity to do this in class before you're hearing it in here. We're going to go into much more detail in here. Oh, too far. All right, we recognize in this here classroom the mineral groups, silicates, carbonates, elementals, halides or halides, your call, sulfurs, and oxides. Okay? Silicates, carbonates, elementals, halides, sulfurs, and oxides. And again, you will see each of these words again. You're going to hear an inordinate amount about the silicate group, again, because it's the biggest one out there. And also, I mentioned this in one of the lab classes. I don't know if I told it to, two of, to both of you guys or not. Crystallography, the, the study of crystals, is um, a huge component of mineralogy. If this were a 300 level mineralogy class, junior year kind of thing, we would be talking about, oh my gosh, all the different things, any three-dimensional geometric shape you could think of and, and then some, okay, as I often say about cleavage when we talk about that. Um, there, there, it's a crystal shape. There's a name for it, and you're going to be measuring their, their planes of intersection with protractors and all kinds of fun stuff. But we don't have the time or the, the need, really, to do that in here, but to pay homage, if you would, to the importance of crystallinity, uh, we talk about one shape. And you're going to hear, again, that in detail in a little bit. But we talk about the crystal shape that's connected to the silicate group, the most commonly occurring one. Huh. Most common mineral group on the face. That must be important. Nine times now, right? SiO4, that's really the only new thing on here. And again, you will see this an awful lot. But um, what's the SI? Silicon. Silicon. How about the O? Somebody oxygen. else. All right, oxygen. How many oxygens? One. How many silicons? One. One. Okay. So this is the silicate crystal that we talk about when we start, well, talking about crystals. Um, anyone remember what quartz is? It's SiO2, all right? Um, I don't know why. Every so often, I'll, well, well, how can we talk about SiO4, and, but then we look at quartz, is it quartz an imperfect crystal? Is quartz, is, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I think they'd save everyone a lot of hassle if they would just have made the formula for quartz SiO4, but they don't. Um, quartz is neat stuff. Um, but uh, its formula is slightly different than this, and it causes some folks a great deal of confusion, and I apologize. Carbonates. Carbonates are minerals that contain the carbonate compound which is CO3. These aren't horribly diverse, okay? Um, you see that the there's the magnesium carbonates and the calcium carbonates. Uh, you got calcite, you got dolomite. Calcite should sound familiar. You've seen or will see that in lab. We don't really look at dolomite. There's a handful of other forms out there. Aragonite is one. But that's really, I mean, especially compared to silicates. But geez, oh, Pete's, these things are everywhere. This is the second most commonly, and I've never seen this in print, but just I know that limestone is absolutely everywhere on this planet. And this is what limestone is made of. So it just, it's, it's out there. It's just not very diverse. All right. 
And even dolomite really only forms in very specific conditions. So um, calcite is, is very common, very common. Now it's worth noting, again, you guys are hearing this for the second time, um, folks in earth science maybe, uh, when, when they hear this, it'll be the first time for them hearing it. Um, that when you're looking at these formulas, the numbers are going to vary. Please don't get hung up on that. Okay. Um, yes, calcite is CaCO3, and that's exactly what you're going to see in the lab book, and then you see the CO3 here, and that's perfect. But there's some um, silicates out there that are going to have, you know, SI4016, um, or they're going to have parentheses around it, and a big number in front of the parentheses, and, and it gets, just look for those, not those ingredients, look for the silicon, look for the oxygen, okay? Um, don't get, don't worry about the numbers. Now, is carbonation, like carbonates and carbonation, is there a reason they sound similar, or is yeah, well, carbonation is carbon dioxide, um, so they have the carbon in common. They don't have the uh, the calcite in common. But you uh, can break down. Hmm, testing my chemistry here. When we put hydrochloric acid on um, calcite to test for calcite, you guys might remember doing that in high school in earth science. Um, it releases uh, amongst the bubbles it releases some CO2, I think. You see the CO3 in there, you just need to remove um, one of the oxygens and one of the calciums and you're back to, to carbon dioxide. But I guess dolomite is a great example of what I was just saying about don't get worry about, uh, I can't find my mouse, there it is. Don't worry about all the brackets and everything. Look at it right there. All right, but you see that CO right there, and you say, oh, that's, that's a carbonate. The elementals, uh, we actually talked about a little earlier this morning. Oops. Single ingredient. One single element makes that ingredient. Um, there's, there's many examples. These are just three that you happen to see in lab. Um, the little bit of confusion, and again, this only comes in if you start to overthink, and I'm not making fun of the overthinkers. I am an overthinker for 50 years now. Okay. Um, copper is a great example. Because what is that hunk of copper in your lab kit going to have all over it, more than likely? Green oxidation. Well, why the heck aren't we calling that an oxide? We call these other rusty metals an oxide. Yeah, and I'm going to give you the same sort of half-assed answer I give you when we talk about sulfur being an elemental. Um, it's more important that it itself is, is isolated, copper is isolated uh, as a single ingredient all in one place than the fact that it happens to oxidize on top of it all. So um, if you look at our oxides, for the most part, those are all compounds, okay? And we're just adding another ingredient into the compound. I'm kind of jumping ahead on slides here. But, um, but yeah, let copper be an elemental. you got this giant hunk of copper in your hand. Don't worry about the fact that there's a little bit of green on it. But you're absolutely right. So, I mean, then that's where, like I said, that's actually good that you think about stuff like that. But don't, don't spin your wheels too long on it. Halides, halides. I thought I updated this to show a little uh, periodic table in here. Um, halide group consists of minerals that have elements from the halide group on the periodic table. Well, what is the halide group on the periodic table? It's the second to the last column. Uh, you remember the noble gases? Okay, that's usually what I talk about. Um, to remind you guys, that's the last column, right? The halides are the column right before that, hence second to the last column. Chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, 
bunch of stuff that ends in I-N-E is there. And uh, as I say in lab, this is usually the last ones you'll get to because you'll run through all the others like this is it have a co3 no it doesn't have a co3 is it just a single ingredient no it's not a single ingredient well where's the sio it doesn't have si well what the hell is it you say oh wait, there was that one that he said we got to look at the periodic table for so when you can't figure out a group after like five minutes try halide okay or just remember chlorine and fluorine The sulfurs. The sulfurs is an artificial group that we use to make life easier on you guys. The sulfurs bond very nicely with oxygen, all right? And the folks that study such things uh, feel the need to differentiate or distinguish the different sulfurs between whether there's two oxygens, three oxygens, four oxygens bonded to them. So you get the sulfates, the sulfites, the, uh, there's another one. Um, again, we don't need to concern ourselves at this level, at this poor point in the game. If you see the giant capital letter S, I'm thrilled, and let's call it a sulfur group and move on, okay? And it's not just me. That's, I, I didn't pull this out of the air or make it up. There's lots of folks doing this. Um, but, uh, again, if you happen to, you, you love this class so much, you go on and you decide that not only do you want to be a geology major, you want to be a mineralogist. Well, they will have it all for you. Don't worry. Okay. And they'll reteach you everything I told you that's wrong. Um, but, uh, but for now, it's perfectly fine. The big glaring example, as I sort of alluded to a moment ago, is please don't call sulfur the mineral, okay? Don't call that a sulfur group. It's much more important that it is just a hunk of sulfur sitting there, i.e. an elemental. Much more important than the fact that that ingredient that it's made of happens to be sulfur. So again, save sulfurs for the compounds, okay? Sulfur groups safe for the compounds. Oxides are pretty straightforward, again, because we give you a little bit of a cheat here. Um, these are going to be your oxidized metals, okay? We all want to say rusty, that's fine. Rust is really just one type of oxidation. There's tarnishing, uh, there's, a, there's a handful of other things. So, so rust is a type of oxidation. It means that oxygen has been added somehow to the formula, usually by exposure to air or water the way things you're used to things rusting in life. However, it is a new mineral. It makes a new compound when we add that um, oxygen to it. Iron is a perfect example. I don't think we see just plain iron, we see iron as an elemental anywhere. All right, it's always got the uh, oxygens attached to it. But at some point, there was just iron. But once it found oxygen, it was all over. So while some artificial groupings are OK, sulfur groups, there are others we don't want you to use. And this is why I try to dissuade you from using um, you know, a mineral book you might have on your bookshelf from when you were uh, 5 or 8 or 10 or 15 or whatever, 20. Some of us go out and buy them when we're 20, and that's awesome. But they don't always use the same mineral groups that we have. And uh, similarly, nowadays, folks don't go buy books. I understand you go to websites. Sure, um, certain websites might use different terminologies. Ores is a big one. Ores is anything that's mined. Well, let's run through that real quick. What do we mine? We mine gold. Gold's an elemental. Uh, we mine uh, iron. Iron's an oxide. Uh, we mine salt. Right there in Syracuse. Salt's a halide. Do you mine sulfur? Or is that a different process? It grows on trees. No, 
Yeah, we, we dig it up. We dig it up. Um, so, yeah, anything that's a rock or a mineral, we, we, do, we do dig up. Um, unless it falls out of a cliff. We're lucky enough for that. Uh, gemstones is another example. Okay, again, that's a very generic term for things that are pretty and shiny and have value. Not something you want to write on your mineral test, though. So ours are based, um, and I guess I didn't possibly say that today. They're, they're very fundamentally based on the, the formulas, okay, the chemical structure. Remember our definition of mineral. We're just going back and illustrating how important that, that is, okay? Yes, sir. So the uh, artificial groups are probably made for uh, like professions that don't need the yeah super detailed knowledge. Yeah, um, and even then, you know, I mean, if you're running a mining company, I almost think they're they're used by outsiders to refer to the professions. You know, um, you know, because you know, if you run a mining company, you're not going to say I sell ores. You're going to say what you actually dig up, what you actually mine, and so on and so forth. So I think it's almost used, you know, I'll say shortcut, we'll say by the media, you know, by the pop, popular culture, we'll refer to these things. All right. Any other questions while we're pausing? Okay. As promised now, that in-depth dive, that zoom in close up look to the silicates. All right. Uh, which is the uh, most common mineral group uh, in the surface of the earth there. And uh, with the compound we like to call silica, that is SiO4. Now, that is also something he mentioned carbon dioxide and carbonates a couple minutes ago. I don't get asked about that one too often, but silica, silicon, silicates. Yeah, those are all three nested things right there, okay? Silicon is the element, Si, silicon. Silica is the compound, SiO, whatever. And silicates or silicates is the mineral group, okay? All right. Yep. So it's compound made of silicon oxygen. You guys already told me this a couple minutes ago. In SiO4, you've got four oxygens and one silicon. What's new here is the tetrahedron bit, the pyramidal bit. And I really should not be saying pyramid, but you'll see why I say pyramid in a minute. It really truly is a tetrahedron, but... Pyramid works just great. Okay, so this here is your tetrahedron. We've got four blue balls and one pink ball in the center there. And I have been meaning to do this for 20... Well, I've been here 20 years and I taught for... Almost 25 years now, I've been meaning to glue three racquetballs together. I haven't done it yet. Because if I did, I, I'd probably have lost it or they would have dry rotted. But either, either way, um, the idea here is that you can see why I refer to this as a pyramid. You got the bottom two blue balls there. Um, they're going uh, left to right, if you would. All right, the top ones are going front to back. One's facing you guys, one of them's going into the board. That's your tetrahedron. Imagine if you took your debit card uh, and held it by all four corners with your thumb and your pointer finger and twisted it <clears throat> so the corners would match that, right? Or approximately tried to do that. Well, that shape would not stand up in, in nature very well. It's you know got to be attached to other things and so on and so forth. And in fact, in a world with gravity, if you let that rest, what would happen? That, that blue ball that's facing the front there would probably lean down onto that fake surface. You'd have a little triangle with three balls, and you'd have a pink ball in the middle, and you'd have another ball on the top. Picture pool balls. 
Yeah, you guys have all seen the pool table, right? So three balls. Now take one of those little bouncy balls you always ask your mom for at the grocery store. If they're, well, they used to be a dime when I was a kid. They're probably a quarter for you guys. Okay, a little super ball. Stick that super ball in the middle there. And again, we're going to live in a world without gravity, so those pool balls aren't going to roll out. So you can set that super ball on there. Then you're going to take a fourth pool ball and put it on top. And again, they're not going to roll away. That's what this would look like in, in nature. Okay? That's the pyramid. All right? You picturing that now? If that were leaning forward, it's a pyramid. The, the next slide will make it even more obvious. So that's why I, I picture it, because a lot of you can't picture this sort of torques, twisted thing. What's important chemically about this is that, that silicon is, is nicely protected, shrouded, encased in those oxygens there, um, which means that the, when it comes time to bond, the oxygen is going to be doing all the bonding. And Again, if you remember your chemistry, we like oxygen bonds. They're great. And I managed to do all of that without using this really long, scary word here. Silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Okay? The silicon oxygen tetrahedron, which is how the crystallographers refer to this. What do the blue balls represent? Oxygen. Great. How about the pink one? Silicon. How many blue balls? Four. How many pink balls? What's the formula? SiO4. Beautiful. Beautiful. And yes, I'm done saying blue balls. Don't worry. One of the math teachers walked by and I said, I don't know. What? Okay. Most common mineral group at the surface of the earth. Uh, there's a gajillion silicates out there as you guys are starting to learn. Okay. Uh, pretty much the only damn thing they have in common is that they all have silica in them. That's not entirely true. You will see, believe it or not, that we're now going to classify the silicates. Don't worry. In lab, in lab, you don't, and on the mineral test, you don't have to use these words. You stop at silicate, okay? Stop at silicate. You said it's a silicate. This is this is quartz. It's a silicate. This is uh, orthoclase feldspar. It's a silicate. I don't want to hear that their frameworks are isolated or chain structures. All these things we're going to teach you now. Keep it simple. So imagine that, and you don't need to write this down because I'm just pointing out something here. We had those top eight elements, right? Believe it or not, the, the most commonly bonded things with silicon and oxygen are the remaining six things in that list. And again, I'd like to think that you see these, see this play out as you go through writing those formulas. And for the, like I said, the first handful you do, you see aluminum and iron all over the place. Calcium and sodium, a little less so. Potassium, even less. Magnesium, yeah. I think we got a magnesium, magnesio silicate in there somewhere. Might be the calc. I forget. But, uh, but boy, you see, you see these top couple all over the place. And again, mathematically, that should make sense to you. Is silica the most bondable uh, compound? Uh, seemingly, huh? I don't know ease of. I can't talk to that. But it, oh, no, I'm totally wrong. So we just had that slide before. Um, I don't know if it's the easiest thing to bond, but it certainly bonds a lot. It's certainly most common. Um, it may be much easier to make other things. I don't know that end on. It's a function of sheer volume, really, um, ingredients. If you look in your cupboard at home and you, you're hungry and you want to bake, you have to make food. You have to make out of what you have. So, 
This is what happens. All right, so I mentioned that there were four ways that we're going to classify uh, silicates. What that really means is that's, that uh, mineralogists have identified four main ways that the silicates tend to be put together. And again, picture these Legos, okay, um, that we just talk about connecting them together one after another. Um, unfortunately, this happens to be a Lego shape that doesn't really exist, but um, nonetheless, bless you, uh, it, it is what it is. So I don't know your depth of perception kind of thing, but hopefully that kind of looks like a pyramid to you guys. Uh, I intended it to. Um, and you see how when I stretch it that way, you really do kind of lose the intended um, tetrahedral effect. But ideally, you could see it manipulated both ways. Right now, I'm looking at it from the side, and I could actually see the front to back bar. But uh, those of you guys looking at it straight on, you probably see the prism pyramid kind of thing. So, Anywho. What does isolated mean? It does not mean that that hunk of mineral in front of you is made up of one single tetrahedron. Did you say it's alone? Well, no. So it does not mean that it is made up of a single tetrahedron. What it means is that all of the little crystals in there are not chemically bonded to one another. They're alone. They're isolated in that manner. This one kind of makes a little more sense in, in retrospect, once we get to the end of the list. Okay. Uh, olivine is a great example. Garnet, not so much, but garnet, garnet is isolated, so what are you going to do? We have to acknowledge it. But olivine makes perfect sense. Is it because uh, olivine uh, is like bumps? Not bumps, but easy to I'm going to tell you about it. All right. So, uh, remember in lab how you guys had olivine in your hand, and for those of you at home, I apologize, I could not get every mineral in your hand, um, but olivine is like a bunch of sand glued together, okay? And part of doing the hardness test, you guys had to drag that nail across it, and uh, you got a handful of green sand, right? So you mistakenly thought olivine was soft, and you went onto the soft tables and couldn't find olivine anywhere. And then I said, oh, yes, chuckle, 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 what you're supposed to do is uh, test the hardness of one of those little crystals, which, of course, you can't do. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. All right. So those were not glued together very well. They were not bonded very well. That's what we mean by isolated. It's a little more than static electricity that's holding it there. You rub a balloon on your hair and you stick it to your sweater. Okay. That's that's that. Um, it's It's not static electricity, but it's... Do we want another vocabulary word? Okay, so it's it's a it's a loose attraction. Olivine and garnet. A chain structure, on the other hand, remember we talked about all those lovely oxygens and that lovely oxygens like to bond together to make oxygen bonds. All right, what's at the corner of each of those? Well, what what's at the corner on each of the on the pyramid? What do the corners represent? The location of what's this? Huh? No. No, we're doing the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Silicon or oxygen. So each corner, what do we have? How many corners are there? Four. Four. And what did we have four of in that formula? Oxygens. All right. So each corner in this representation is an oxygen. That's silicon. You can't even see it. It's tucked in the middle there. So when the corners touch, that's an oxygen to an oxygen bond. Okay. And um, that's what distinguishes these from the isolated. Those oxygens are stuck, are bonded together. Now, what stops the oxygens from bonding in the other one? Again, I, I apologize. I don't know. Okay, but they underwent a process wherein the oxygens decided not to bond together. I'm sure it has something to do with electrons. It usually does. All right, but in this case, uh, they are bonded together. Picture a daisy chain, okay? Paper clips you might have made or actual daisies, whatever. Okay, linked together end to end to end. That's what we call a single chain. 
silicate. Now, you could take those chain structures and you could put two of them together. We call that, guess what, a double chain. And this is exemplified with um, augite and hornblende. You may or may not remember augite and hornblende. Um, augite, we told you, was uh, blackish green and kind of grainy. But the hornblende, it, it loses the green. We can't accommodate, we can't account for that. But more importantly, the, the hornblende has those long crystals in it. Now, in my mind, that is saying that, hey, hornblende is the double chain. It's twice as wide. It's that much easier to see the structure, okay, than it is in the augite. And in the augite, you might see a little structure, but for the most part, it's just a jumbled mess. So um, that's my ex reason for when you look as, when you look at those two on paper, they're darn near identical, darn near identical. Um, the same ingredients, same this, same that, same hardness, um, but the crystal structure does vary, and that's the only, to me, logical reason I've seen over the years for that. So isolated, single chain, double chain. We move up to sheet. Sheet is going to be three or more chains, often significantly more, uh, because you want to form a sheet. So now you're bonding potentially all three corners, not the top. We'll talk about that in a minute. But all three corners of that pyramid that's sitting there on the bottom all right, is bonded to the oxygens next to it, and you're making a very, very strong sheet structure. Now, as you see here, this is your, your micas. Um, you might not have had a chance to play with mica yet. If you haven't, please, next time you're in the lab room, do. All right. What you'll notice about the, the micas is that those individual sheets themselves you could squeeze them together practically practically end to end with your thumb and your forefinger, and that sucker won't break, all right? But you go to peel it apart, one layer to another layer, it comes very easily. That's because what's holding those together layer to layer is the same thing that was holding those grains together for the olivine. Not a whole lot, right? But boy, those oxygen bonds across the across that plane, solid. So talc is also a sheet silicate, but it's so gosh darn soft, and you guys are always rubbing at this feel talky, right, um, that you blur it out of existence. You don't really see the, the cleavage on the talc. Um, I have, and I know I just spent how much time telling you the properties don't vary, I have a harder talc that we put out. Um, it's actually in the box. Some of you might have grabbed one. But there's a harder talc that hasn't really blurred out yet. And when I do put them out on the test, I try to use that one so you can actually see the, uh, the cleavage layering. Because you, you spend all this time remembering that talc has cleavage, but you never, you never see it. So, um, so anywho, very obvious with the, with the muscovite, or with the micas. If you didn't know what mica was, there you go. Or you didn't remember, I should say. All right, last but not least. Last but not least. We have. Sorry, I thought I had a moderate animation here, and I guess I do not. Um, we have the frameworks. And what my really low-tech animation used to be was me dropping another layer of, uh, another sheet of tetrahedra on top of these. Okay, um, because if you think about it, that's exactly what the micas were, right? A whole bunch of sheets stacked together. They weren't bonded, though. Now, now we're trying to take that last, imagine the top of those pyramids there, the bottom row of pyramids, is bonding to the bottom of the top row of pyramids. If you follow that. Now, your book's going to tell you that there's other things involved here, and, and it's right. Okay, but we've spent all this time talking about oxygen bonds. I just want to keep it simple 
there is slightly more going on there. But in essence, we're taking that last bit of oxygens from the top of the pyramid that haven't bonded to anything yet, and we're bonding them to the bottom of the pyramids above them. And that makes our strongest structure the frameworks. All right? Your quartzes, your feldspars, flesh. These are some of your strongest uh, minerals out there. And I think in a second you're going to see that they're also the most common. Yeah, the most common of the mineral silicate mineral groups out there. Um, again, in my mind, you know, it's simply a matter of they're the most durable. So over the years they've built up, so to speak, or the others have, have you know, weathered away. But um, at any rate, somewhere in there lies the truth. You saw three quartzes, four quartzes in lab. You saw three feldspars. There are a bunch of feldspars out there. There's like feldsparologists. Um, that's not what they call themselves, but they, they study this. It's, it's this continuum, this spectrum of feldspars, and it's insane. Um, but they, uh, it's, it's incredibly, it's that common. Okay, it's that common. And quartz, quartz tends to be a lot more unique, at least in my eye. I've said it before, you'll hear me say it again, I am not a mineralogist by any means. Okay, That's like going to your you know, general practitioner and asking them about your foot or something like that. You know, like, well, well, I think it's this, but we'll send you to a foot doctor kind of thing. So um, I'm a geologist, but my mineralogy is minimal. There's some wonderful examples, in case you've forgotten what we were talking about. We had some feldspars on the right there, some quartzes on the left. And that, my friends, is our discussion on minerals. You spend way more time in lab on minerals than we do in lecture, okay? You're gonna have a dozen questions, let's just say, uh, off of this PowerPoint, okay, on the next test, it's important. But what's more important, and, and we don't often see the overlap between lecture and lab, all right? Earth science, this is not necessarily so true for you. Uh, we de-emphasize the lab portion of minerals and rocks for you guys, because it's not geology class, but um, in here, Okay, where we're putting the importance um, for minerals really is in the lab room. So I, I can't underestimate how important it is you guys put the time in on that end of things. Don't say, oh, it's just lab, it's just a, it's a lab class. That mineral test, if you go in not studying for it, it's tough and it's going to hurt, especially if the test we just took the other day was awesome for you, all right? And then you're going to get back like a six on the mineral test because it's either, oh, this is just lab, it's not important. It's going to drag that wonderful lecture test grade back down. Now, the good news is, is that another lecture test grade will bring it right back up, okay, because they're all even. But it would be great to have two good grades going into midterms, right? And believe it or not, it is coming soonish. So uh, please put the time in for learning the minerals. All right, any questions about minerals, mineralogy, etc. that we haven't already pondered today? Again, if you see it in the book and we didn't talk about it, don't worry about it, but feel free to read it and even ask me about it. I may or may not be able to, quote, to respond. Let's see. Okay, and you folks at home, uh, again, if you have any questions, please email or stop by office hours. <laughs>